Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Marcus. He is an author, artist, academic based in Toronto. He recently got married to his partner of 10 years, Andrew, and they are raising a child with their platonic partner. So I'm so excited to have Marcus here today to talk about his life, his relationships, his family dynamic, and he shares all of that on TikTok. His handle there is Marcus Bones, which of course I'll be leaving in the description. So Marcus, thank you so much. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hi, Sarah. Uh, It's great to chat with you today. Um, Yeah, so I, as you said, I'm an author, artist, and uh, academic. So I'm an author of young adult fiction, mainly. Uh, I have, I think, five books out right now, and I'm working on two more currently. I mostly write about LGBTQ young people uh, and finding community, finding love, finding themselves. Um, I try to put out stories into the world that are really um, joyful and also honest about what it's like to be an LGBTQ teen because I had a pretty tough uh, time doing that. Um, I, I am also an artist. I make watercolor p- paintings and uh, my silly little videos, I guess you could also count as art from my TikTok. Um, and finally, I'm an academic as well because I go to Queen's University, uh, which is located about three hours outside of Toronto. And uh, there I am pursuing a PhD in gender studies. Um, and then this TikTok thing kind of just happened to me. I just kind of got into it. Uh, then just like enjoyed the app. I I've always been active on social media. Like I had a YouTube back in the day and then a Tumblr and now a TikTok and, uh, my TikTok's definitely gotten way bigger than I ever thought it could be. But, um, I just am happy to share a little slice of our life. And while for a lot of people, it seems very exceptional for us, it's like just our every day. So it's easy to make content about it. Cause I'm like, okay. We're going to get the baby ready and go for a walk. I'm saying goodbye to my husband. Okay, we're saying goodbye to Hannah, our co-parent. And now we're going for our walk around the neighborhood. You know, it's just nice. So that's that's me. Great. Well, we obviously have a lot of things we can talk about. But do you want to start with kind of your professional life? You know, how you got into all of the things you're doing between writing books, doing the paintings, um, mm-hmm. and also studying for a PhD. <laughs> yeah, uh, I am very busy. That's what people always tell me when I tell them about my life. They're like, you're very busy. And that was what actually my grandparents, so I'm really, really close with my grandparents. They basically raised me. And when I told them that my partner and I, uh, Andrew and I, were uh, opening our relationship, dating multiple people, and planning to co-parent with our platonic uh, partner, Hannah, their response was, wow, you always have so much going on. <laughs> I feel like that is like this, the motto of my life. Um, but I did mention like, yeah, I had a pretty tough um, young, younger life. Um, I realized very, very young that I was transgender. Um, I was assigned female at birth. And then around five or six, I think, I went to my grandmother, uh, my paternal grandmother, and told her, that I, I didn't feel like a girl, um, that I felt like more of a boy. And she did not know what to do with that information. Um, and she, I don't remember her saying anything harmful about it. It just sort of was played off. It's like, oh, you're a kid. You're playing pretend, whatever. Um, but that feeling persisted uh, as I grew older. Uh, my parents uh, ended up separating. They had me quite young. And uh, and then they both se- like separated from each other and remarried and had more children with their new partners. And I sort of floated in this liminal space between both of their homes, not feeling quite a part of either one. Um, my dad was single a lot longer. So at his house, it was like a lot of alone time with my thoughts. Um, and it was maybe during some of that alone time that I like started learning about what it meant to be trans, reading like web comics on the internet. Um, and around like 15, 16, I was pretty certain that that's, uh, how I identified as a queer trans man. Um, and when I realized that <laughs> it was a bit scary cause I, I knew that I would struggle to find support. Um, and I was right. Um, I tried to write a coming out letter, but I never actually got a chance to share it because instead, um, one night I was sleeping at my mom's house and she went through 
my uh, internet browsing history, read my emails. Uh, I think she also probably read my diary and confronted me early in the morning on a Sunday morning telling me uh, I wasn't allowed to pretend to be a boy. I wasn't allowed to tell anybody my name was Mark. I had to get rid of all of my old clothes because I had been dressing like pretty masculine. Um, and that I was going to church with her this morning to learn some lessons about, I don't know, I guess how to be straight. Um, which is ironic because the congregation was not actually very homophobic. It was mostly just her and her husband. Um, and that was when I was about 16 and it started a, a very long struggle between all of us. My dad just didn't really want to acknowledge it, talk about it, was not pleased with the situation. Uh, my mom was kind of freaking out. Um, and I ended up just like hiding a lot of who I was. And then eventually it was like, I, they would think that I was, you know, quote unquote, back to normal. And then they would find another place where I had, but like, you know, snuck off to like the LGBT center or something, which they tried to stop me from going to where I was seeing like a therapist and getting support for my mental health. Um, and finally, when I'm maybe a week after I turned 17, uh, my mom and I, I was staying at her house. We had this big blow up fight. And uh, she told me, you know, if you really want to go live in your misery, you can just go do that. And uh, I packed up a handful of my things and left, um, went to my dad's for a couple nights, but left there as well after it was clear he was not going to support my transition either. Um, and that's when I moved in with my grandparents, maybe about, well, I spent about three months couch surf surfing. And then my grandparents actually found me wandering around downtown, um, picked me up and gave me a ride to where I was going and told me, you know, I know your parents said that we would never accept you, but uh, actually we love you for who you are and it, it, we have no problem with this. Um, and I had been, like I said, couch surfing and I was in pretty insecure housing. So I took them up on the offer to move in and they made sure that I finished high school and set me up for like, a decent start in life. So that was kind of the foundation for like who I am in the world in so many ways, even though it was like a deeply traumatizing period. It also taught me so much about the importance of like, uh, family, ironically, like, I don't know if people would take that lesson away from it, but my grandparents standing up for me like that really reminded me like what family really looks like in that your bio family can stand up for you. And also you can have found family, chosen family, and they really became like parents in my life. And we're still extremely close. Um, that's my, like both sets of my grandparents are actually still alive. And I'm also quite close with my paternal grandparents who, even though I didn't live with them um, and they had a bit of a harder time with my coming out, they've always, you know, loved me unequivocally. Um, but my maternal grandparents really, you know, became parental figures in my life. And I still call both sets of grandparents every weekend and catch up with them about life uh, here at 31 years old, many years later. <laughs> so yeah, that beginning to my uh, like, young adult life really put me on a track that had a lot of hardships with it, which we can talk more about, but also made me uh, really see the importance and value of loving people for who they are and wanting to uh, learn to love myself and love other people authentically. And eventually I got involved in uh, writing novels and creating art and um, working at LGBTQ centers of various kinds. Uh, and finally I ended up, um, pursuing a degree in sociology and then gender studies and now a PhD, um, which is all about how and why we come together through uh, collective storytelling um, among trans communities. So yeah, that's sort of like my, my beginning story. Um, there's more stuff like I, there was the years I spent between the end of high school and before going to university, I spent like three years kind of scraping by making art on street corners and doing sex work to pay the bills. Um, that was pretty tough. Um, and I wrote like short stories about all of my clients and drew portraits or like little, little scenes. And I sold them as like zines. That was kind of my beginning as an author. Um, and of course there's the love story of my life, which is meeting Andrew when I was, um, 21. And he just, he continues to be my absolute rock in life. 10 years later, he's like a phenomenal partner. Um, and we, obviously there's the story of how our family came together, which we can get to in a minute. But that's, yeah, why don't we start there? <laughs> I feel like I've been talking for a while. No worries. Um, and it's great to hear how you had that support in your grandparents. I think a lot of times we hear, um, you know, similar to your parents where like there isn't support and especially in older generations, whether grandparents are young or old, 
So to have yours be that support for you and, and be that close family network, um, and then to go beyond and have additional chosen family. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit more um, about Andrew and your relationship? You mentioned, you know, opening it up um, and being polyamorous mm -hmm. and what that means for your relationship. Yeah. So I, I met Andrew when I was 21, uh, my first year at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University, which is um, a big school downtown here. Uh, I was doing a sociology degree and he was in his last year of getting a theater degree. Um, and he currently works um, at the Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, they have like a, a permanent theater downtown where he works. Um, and he was uh, vice president of the students union. Um, and I had just gotten a job working at the LGBT center. So technically he was my boss. Um, <laughs> he wasn't directly on top of me. So it wasn't super inappropriate, but, uh, like in the hierarchy of the organization, I was like a little, you know, grunt and he was like, you know, the top level basically right under the president. Um, and, uh, I would always make ex excuses to go up to his office, uh, and like do, you know, photocopying or something so I could make eyes at him. And I found out later that he, even before I got my job at the LGBT center, he had been eyeing me around campus because we, I was a volunteer uh, handing out like flyers and promoting stuff on campus. And uh, he would intentionally go and do this like flyer handout work that he really didn't have to be doing so that he might run into me. Um, so we had been making eyes at each other for a while. And then we had to do um, an anti-oppression training, anti-O and anti-racism uh, anti training that was part of like everybody who worked at the student union did this. It was just a yearly uh, activity. And you'd go and you would do basically a day long of training on uh, how to be anti-oppressive, what anti-racism looks like, um, have sort of like a sharing circle, a check in about the organization. And then everybody would go downstairs to the pub afterwards, uh, the like campus pub, and everybody would drink. Um, well, I guess some people probably had non-alcoholic drinks, but <laughs> I definitely had some drinks that night. Um, and Andrew and I sat next to each other and, you know, quietly started chatting and, uh, we had chatted a little bit at the Antio workshop. Um, but slowly throughout the night, all of our coworkers started leaving, you know, one by one until maybe around midnight or 1am, we were the last ones there and just talking up a storm. I had just finished, uh, couch surfing, um, in the, in the years prior, I mentioned after moving out of my grandparents' house before I started university, I moved to Toronto by myself when I was 19 um, to have top surgery as part of my transition. Um, and I ended up just staying because it just was a lot bigger than the city I grew up in, which is Winnipeg. It was, it felt more queer inclusive here. It felt like I might find community here. And even though it was really hard to leave my grandparents, I just knew I was supposed to be here. So um, I had been living in the city for a couple of years, but really struggling with finding an affordable place. I had basically been struggling with homelessness for a few years. So I took it as an opportunity to couch surf. And I ended up couch surfing through Toronto, Montreal, New York, Philadelphia, uh, Orlando, Houston, LA, and San Francisco. Um, and I filmed the entire experience and I interviewed all the trans people I met along the way, um, I got about 50 interviews and I had just finished this big project and I was going to try to turn it into a film, which I did. It's called Mosaic, a, a documentary and dialogue, and it's on YouTube now and my, my website. And uh, so I told them all about the stories I had from these like weird little places I'd stayed, you know, like dingy basements where I woke up with a spider bite on my hand and I'm not going to go to the doctor in America. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, or, you know, like adventures I had wandering around New York city and, uh, having tourists ask me for directions because they thought I was local, which was a huge compliment. Um, or, you know, the thunderstorms in Orlando or, uh, you know, Peyton people's houses in exchange for a place to stay in Houston, all kinds of stuff. And he was just, so in love with that. He loves listening to, to big stories. Uh, and we uh, went home together that night. <laughs> um, and I thought it was going to be like a one night stand because he was just, you know, I don't know. I wasn't in a place in my life where I was looking to for love. I was not interested in a serious relationship at all. Um, and I had actually just told my new roommate because I finally did get stable housing. And I told my roommate, oh, you know, I'm, I get around. So you'll probably see lots of guys coming in and out of this house. <laughs> and I brought home one guy and that's who stayed. Um, and Andrew and I actually stayed monogamous for about a year of, uh, of our relationship. 
Uh, and then about a year in, at the same time, basically, we both brought up the idea that we wanted to open the relationship and date other people as well as each other. Um, so we started dating other folks. I had a couple of girlfriends and a couple other dates with other guys and non-binary people. Um, Andrew did as well. Uh, but we just kind of kept coming back to each other and those other relationships didn't really go super long um, until maybe about five years into our relationship where he ended up getting with uh, Mackenzie, who is still his girlfriend. So they've been together, I think, about five years now. Um, and what's hilarious is that Mackenzie is also my ex, <laughs> um, which is it's such a small queer world. But she was actually the last person I dated before I met Andrew. And uh, she and I get along great. Our breakup was pretty amicable. And uh, we had both changed a lot when we sort of showed up in each other's lives again. Um, and so Andrew then got this more serious girlfriend. Andrew and I were still very serious with each other, but we weren't living together. We weren't making super long-term plans. Um, but we did have one plan in mind. Um, when we were about 24, his roommate, Hannah who had been a longtime friend of mine. I, I had known her since I, she was one of the first people I met in Toronto uh, when I was 19. And I had introduced them because they both needed a roommate. Hannah approached the two of us and said, you know what, you know that I've been feeling called to be a parent. I feel like I'm really supposed to have a child. You also know that I don't have a partner with whom I can do that. Uh, I, you know, she wasn't dating anybody uh, who was doing that with her. Um, and, you know, she was like, also, you know, even if I did, unless I ended up with a trans woman, which could happen, um, but if I end up with a cis woman, I will probably need a donor because um, Hannah largely dates like women and, and other non-binary people. Um, so she was like, you know, I want to start thinking about not waiting for a partner to show up in my life before trying to work on finding a donor to have a child. Andrew, would you consider being a sperm donor for me? Um, and if I don't find a partner, I'm just going to single parent. Cause that's how strongly I feel I'm supposed to have a child. And, uh, he and I, and Hannah sat down and he, uh, shared that he would be definitely open to being a donor, but he would like a relationship with that kid. Um, and the more we talked about it, you know, I had been open to having children. Um, but even though I physically could carry a child, it wasn't something that I was like super keen to do. I could find it. I'd probably find that very dysphoria inducing, um, and, uh, eventually we came to the conclusion together that Hannah would carry a child with Andrew as the sperm donor, and all three of us would be the parents of that child. Um, and that was a decision we made in, I think, 2014, 2015. <laughs> um, and it took us like seven years <laughs> to do it. But over those years, you know, Andrew got his girlfriend. I pursued my education. Eventually, we moved in together. Um, and the agreement, you know, we always just came back to check in on it. Uh, we, it continued to be sort of a steady part of our life. And we would sort of meet up and talk about it. Um, I, When I moved in with Andrew, obviously, I also moved in with Hannah, the person we we're co-parenting with. Um, they continued to be roommates throughout this whole time. And we we knew this is a bit unusual of a setup. So we wanted to make sure that we uh, talked about it a long time first and then lived together for a while first and make sure that we got along as roommates because you like we wanted to live together to raise this child. And then, you know, obviously going through the fertility process itself. So the plan had always been that we would accomplish those goals and start actually trying for the child before Hannah was 30. And the year that she turned 30 was 2020. <laughs> and he had planned to start in March 2020. <laughs> so that was thrown off course a little bit. But we decided that we were going to pursue it anyway. Um, and it took a year of trying and eventually going through IVF. But we did manage to conceive a child together. Hannah carried and uh, baby River was delivered in January 2022. Um, yeah, so that's sort of a short summary of, of our co-parenting journey and our, our relationship with polyamory. Um, Andrew's girlfriend is still in our life and she's an auntie to our child. Um, she's not going to be a co-parent. That's not something she's interested in. Um, Andrew and I recently got married. She was in our wedding party. She gave a beautiful speech at the wedding. She did our graphic design for the wedding, uh, posters and stuff like 
she is totally, totally supportive and she's very happy as uh, like, I mean, I, I shouldn't really speak for her, but my understanding is that she is very happy and content being uh, not living with us, but being involved in our life and being close together and being an auntie to our child. And yeah, that's sort of what our family life looks like right now. Yeah. And it's great to hear how much um, support there is between all of you and the fact that you, um, you know, didn't kind of rush into the decision to co-parent. You know, you took the time to truly discuss what that would mean and make sure it would really work. So um, obviously Baby River is not even a year yet. Mm -hmm. Um, So have you talked about what River will call each of you as their parents? Yeah, so um, we use they and them pronouns for River, just for context. So, uh, and for what River will call us, uh, we kind of think that River will probably call me Dad, Andrew, Papa, and Hannah will be Momo. That's the language we use right now. That's so cute. I really, I really like all of those names. Um, I, you always hear it when you're like, oh, what are the grandparents going to be named? So I was curious mm-hmm. because there's three of you. Um, yeah. so that's really fun. Yeah. Well, and, um, we, for a while we kind of were like, well, let River pick it. But then we were like, oh, they're not going to start talking for a while. <laughs> so we should probably just pick something. Um, and I, It's weird hearing myself called dad, but it is a title that's really growing on me. And Andrew loves to be a pop or a papa or or pa. Um, And uh, Hannah really took a while figuring out what felt right for her. I can't really speak to, you know, the details of her internal journey with that. But I know that mom didn't quite feel right. um, But she wanted something close to that that felt like it was still a parental title. She didn't want to be Hannah. Um, cause I had said we could just use our names and she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually she came to Momo, which, uh, we like to joke is for homo mom, <laughs> mama homo. Um, but it just sort of is a nice name that rhymes. It's going to be easy for a kid to say, um, and still speaks to who she is in the family. And we, I, I actually, for both of their birthdays, I got some board books printed that One of them is called Daddy and Papa, and it's pictures of me and Andrew with River. And the other one is called Momo and Me, and it's pictures of Hannah and River. So River will learn those words um, reading those books with us. That that is absolutely adorable. Um, (laughs) Have you run into any, like, legal issues or anything when it comes to, like, taking River to a doctor and the fact that there are three of you and that you are using they, them pronouns until River is old enough to decide their gender. Yeah. So we have had some challenges. Um, so yeah, the they, them thing is that we're practicing gender neutral parenting, which is basically um, not assuming your child's gender until they're uh, of an age where they can tell you themselves. And most children raised in this fashion are able to articulate their preference for a pronoun around the ages, like two to five, really. Um, so, you know, well before school age, uh, you know, River will probably share with us, uh, barring any sort of unforeseen, uh, changes in life, um, they'll almost certainly be able to share with us what pronouns feel right and probably something close to what their gender identity feels like. And that was a decision we made together. It was, um, we talked about it for a long time and we actually were planning to use sort of alternating pronouns, um, you know, he, they, or she, they, depending on uh, what River's assigned sex was going to be, which we didn't know at the time. Um, but when River was actually born and we tried practicing that, it just didn't really ring true. Um, I found like I was getting in my head all the time thinking, oh, which pronoun should I use right now? Um And I know people who use alternating pronouns. I use alternating pronouns. It's not a huge deal, but for some reason it just, felt more true to the kind of parents we want to be and the kind of child we want to raise to just fully embrace using gender neutral language. So, uh, and, and we, you know, like to call it gender expansive parenting because we don't try to force things to be totally neutral, but instead try to incorporate all the options that we can think of. So River has cute little poofy dresses and a cute little bow tie and wore like a nice little vest and trousers for the wedding and then had like a dress they changed into afterwards and have all all manner of toys. Um, 
And that was definitely a parenting decision that a lot of people did not understand outside of our like direct queer community. We do know a fair amount of other people who are doing gender neutral parenting or something similar to it. But like, you know, our extended family and relatives were sort of like, okay, you're doing a weird gay thing again. (laughs) But I feel like we almost um, (laughs) built up tolerance for that because of our three parent setup. Like, the three parent family dynamic was actually much more of a concern for for my family than the gender neutral parenting method like that they by the time we brought that up they were like okay whatever <laughs> just do your thing um but my family especially was really worried about what it would look like for me to be a non biological parent to this child when the two bio parents are involved you know i think they could have maybe wrapped their head around andrew and i having a surrogate and raising the child together or Hannah having a baby and us being sort of like uncles or something. But this idea that we are all equal co-parents to a child and that there's three of us, my family was really concerned about my right to custody. If anything was to ever happen, heaven forbid, would there be a situation where I wouldn't have a right to this child? Um, so that was a very fair concern. And we are very fortunate that where we live in Ontario, you can actually have up to four parents on the birth certificate, like from day one. So all three of us from River's birth were able to be legally recognized as parents. And there's not a distinction on the birth certificate between myself and Andrew. We're both listed as fathers of the child. Um, And that was a huge relief for me. Uh, And I owe like we owe that to the the queer and trans families who came before us who fought for that um because prior to that decision um which i think was made in 2016 uh due to, to activist effort uh you i would have had to adopt my own child we might have run into issues where um we all wouldn't have the same parental rights it just would have been a bit more of a headache um and more risky for me um but with that in place, I could just totally focus on being a parent. And I very much feel like River is my child. That's never been like, I, I don't look at them and see Andrew and Hannah. I look at them and see River and I just, we have a connection. They know who I am. I know who that they are and we are that to each other. Um, but yeah, so our families adjusted, had, had to adjust to the idea a little bit, but they've broadly been very supportive, which I'm so thankful for. My grandparents love Andrew and Hannah. They've had them over for holidays and visits. And um, we did uh, a small backyard wedding um, with my grandparents uh, in their in the backyard of the house where I lived during high school. Um, and Andrew and I said our vows and my paternal grandfather, who's a minister, uh, presided over the ceremony. So all four of my grandparents who are amazingly still alive got to watch me get married and also watch me become a parent and meet my child and just totally welcome this big gay family. And in fact, my grandfather, the minister, um, invited Hannah to come up during the commitment ceremony and also give a vow to co-parent with us and to raise this child together and build a family together, which was so affirming and beautiful that, you know, this guy who had such a, like, he's always loved me and tried really hard, but I know at first it was very challenging for him to accept my identities and the weird ways that I'm living my life. So for him to do that was just massively affirming. Um, And I know for my maternal grandparents, it meant the world to them that we had that commitment ceremony in their yard. Um, We decided not to get legally married there and instead had a legal wedding later. But my maternal grandmother's health has declined pretty significantly. And she was, we knew she wouldn't be able to travel to Toronto for a legal ceremony. So having that commitment ceremony there meant the world to me and to them. And they have uh, called me and said, you know, that you've given us a gift in the way that we can look in our backyard every day and see you getting married, which just fills my heart. Um, so our families have been super supportive. Uh, Andrew's dad, I think is just like along for the ride. He, he's just, <laughs> he's just him. Um, Andrew's mom isn't in the picture, unfortunately. She passed away when he was young, but I I believe that she would have been very loving and supportive of our family. Um, And then Hannah's family has welcomed Andrew and I with open arms. Um, Andrew and I don't have any really close relatives in Ontario. I have a couple, um, like, you know, aunts and stuff, but we're not super tight. Um, So we go to Hannah's family for, you know, Christmas, Easter, whatever. 
Um, we go there for family dinners. Hannah's sister has a baby right around the same age as River, so we get the babies together. And I mean, at this age, you basically sit them at down and make them stare at each other. Um, but yeah, our families have been amazing, and Hannah's family especially. Like you know, they didn't have to be so overwhelmingly welcoming to these two random gay guys she started bringing home for family dinner, and she started bringing us home like years before River was conceived. She, like we just started going there every year. Um, and just saying, yeah, one day we're going to have a baby. And they were like, okay, <laughs> and we did. And they were like, wow, you really did that. Um, <laughs> and they love River. I mean, everybody in the family loves River. And we're also blessed to have a beautiful, beautiful chosen family that has like completely wrapped their arms around us with love. Um, so that's like the family front. Uh, on the other side of things like accessing healthcare, for example, or navigating legal systems. Sometimes it's been tricky um, being a three parent family practicing gender neutral parenting. Um, you know, for example, the first time River got sick, uh, sick enough to need to go to the emergency room, uh, Andrew was not allowed in the room because Han he went to go park the car while Hannah and I went in with the baby. And then when he got to the front desk, they said, sorry, two parents only. And I understand that, like, you know, it's, it's, partially COVID related to limit, uh, you know, the amount of people in the room. Um, and I, I respect that, but also like it felt disappointing that they would not consider like making an exception or, or whatever. Um, and you know, there's not that many three parent <laughs> families out there. Like, I don't think it would destroy the system for Andrew to be allowed in the room. And instead he had to watch over uh, like FaceTime as River was like scream crying and he could do nothing to be there to to hold them and love on them like the, the other two of us were doing. And it was really hard. Um, and, you know, when Hannah was, was delivering as well, like back in January, our midwife had to advocate for us to be allowed in uh, the birthing suite because only one co-parent was allowed. Um, but thanks to our midwife's uh, advocacy, we were allowed to come to the birthing suite, but we weren't allowed to go to the postpartum suite. So then we had to like take turns, one person going home and one person staying at the hospital. Um, and Hannah was at the hospital for five days and River had to be in the NICU for a couple nights. So that was pretty hard to choose which parent gets to stay and which one has to leave. So those situations have definitely been difficult. Um, and yeah, I would say actually, I think the, the biggest challenges have been in like the legal and medical fields, but you know, we just sort of take it as we go. Um, and we're really thankful that we, we live in a, such a supportive community with such like loving friends and, and great family. And even like our neighbors on the street who definitely, like I have had people stop me and ask like, whose baby is this? And we shall see all of you coming out of the house with the baby. And I'm like, it's all of ours. And they're like, okay, <laughs> guess that's the world we're in now. Like the social aspect has actually been so much more supportive than I was expecting. Um, and even the gender neutral parenting thing, a lot of people don't always get it, but at the very least they're like, okay, this is the thing you're doing. Um, and, and I appreciate that. You know, you don't have to understand something intimately to respect that that's what a, a person's choosing to do. Right. And the fact that all three of you are on the birth certificate, I think speaks volumes to the inclusivity of where you are that those things that you were running into and maybe in a post COVID world will also be easier to change that. It's more of a, you know, it's parents allowed in the room. You know, if, if they're mm -hmm. allowing four parents up to four parents on the birth certificate, that's how many parents should be allowed in these other situations where it's a parents only or no more than two because of COVID that it's no more than two or parents only. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I respect that it's, it's pretty much a COVID thing. And, you know, the staff have always been really apologetic. It's not their fault, right? Like they're just trying to obey the policy and mm -hmm. the healthcare system is already so overwhelmed and so overworked. Like the last thing we want to do is stress it even further. Um, what I found hard though, is that when I emailed the representatives of the hospital who are in charge of things like diversity and inclusion, uh, we had a couple of emails back and forth where they basically just quoted the policy at me. And I was like, okay, well, like, would you be open to making an exception for us? Uh, is there any way that we like, you know, could have uh, some like, you know, heaven forbid, if we were in like a life and death scenario with River, how could we choose who could be at their bedside? That is an impossible decision. So if that was to ever take place, I would want to have that sorted well in advance. Like you don't want to be navigating that in the moment. So I tried to email them to talk about, okay, 
what would that look like? Is there a way to ne- negotiate this? Um, and after a few emails back and forth, they basically quoted the policy at me again. Uh, and I said, okay, look, I get this is your policy. It sounds like that's not changing. Do you know if you're going to evaluate it anytime soon? Is there any way we could have input on that process? Could you at least notify us if and when the policy is changed? And then I never got a reply email. And that was maybe four months ago. Um, so that is what I found really disappointing was that on the administrative level, it feels like a lot of times we fall through the cracks. Um, and the great irony was that like this whole experience at the emergency room took place during Pride Month. And the whole emerge room was like full of rainbow flags. <laughs> Um, and you know, this like diversity and inclusion rep is emailing me with like a pride signature or whatever to the email. Um, and yet here is an actual queer trans family telling you what they need to truly be included at your facility. And we're basically just getting shrugged off. At least that's how it felt. Um, so those moments are harder. Um, but I, you know, the part of the reason I make my TikToks and do the work that I do is trying to just show our family to the world so that when people run into families like ours, they're not as taken aback and that hopefully over time we start to see even small change. Um, you know, I think that those small moments of change help us build towards uh, bigger worlds that look that where we have, you know, totally upended heteronormativity and all the, the poisonous things that come along with it um, and really embrace the idea that families can look in so many different ways. And in fact, that that is part of what makes Uh, human life so beautiful that we can find uh, love in so many different venues and that um, that you can raise a child with uh, with people who genuinely want a child in their life and will treasure that small human yeah Um, something I always hear back from people is that um, they wish that that everybody would take so much time and care before bringing a small person into the world and I know that's not an option for everyone like you know my mom she wasn't planning to have have me i was an oopsie baby that happened after a folk festival (laughs) um my dad was a folk musician um and that happens sometimes um but i wish that for those who are intentionally planning on bringing kids into the world that they would sometimes sit down and take the time to really ask themselves like what does it mean to take on this responsibility how can we raise a child uh in a, a truly loving manner that accepts them for whoever they're going to be um Yeah, Uh, I wish that maybe people would take the time for that a little bit more. Yes. Now, are you willing to share like what the day to day is like, like how much you're each doing? Like instead of two parents, Mm -hmm. you now have three parents, you know, changing diapers, waking up in the middle of the night and all of Mm -hmm. that. Yes. Uh, Honestly, the number one response I've gotten mainly from other parents when they find out we're a three parent household is wow, that is so smart. <laughs> I I would love to have another adult at home. Um, obviously, there are lots of people doing this by themselves, and that is harrowing. Um, but I think even in a two-parent family dynamic, people get exhausted, and it is really, really hard. It's a huge strain on your relationships. And we definitely still, you know, we've had plenty of struggles, lots of sleepless nights, lots of moments where we are not our best selves with each other. Um, But I would say, broadly speaking, having three parents is a massive advantage when it comes to the day to day. Um, I think the easiest way to describe it is just to give you our sort of daily routine. So uh, we have a bed in the nursery. Um, We are very fortunate to have a four bedroom uh, apartment in downtown Toronto. And we've uh, Andrew and Hannah have been here long enough that it's rent controlled. Uh, and the rent is actually affordable, which is ridiculous. So I'm currently sitting in my office, which is somehow separate from my bedroom, kind of unheard of in Toronto. Um, Andrew and I share a bedroom. And then uh, on the main floor of the home, Hannah has her own bedroom. And then we have a nursery. And in the nursery, we have a small, like twin size mattress. Um, so basically, Andrew and I take turns sleeping on that twin mattress. It's usually me. Um, because Andrew is back at work full time and I am currently off work. Um, on my PhD is being funded with a scholarship from the social science and humanities research council, um, which, uh, is, was a huge deal to get. Um, I was shocked when I, when I managed to receive it. And part of that scholarship includes a year of full paid parental leave. 
So I am currently on 12 months of paid parental leave with the only stipulation that I can do no homework <laughs> while I'm on parental leave. So, uh, oh no, I have to focus on being a parent, <laughs> just <laughs> such a gift and like a huge, huge privilege. Um, so I'm on full-time leave, uh, and I am, when I'm not parenting, I'm pursuing my creative pursuits. Like I mentioned, I'm writing two new books that are both coming out next year. So, you know, Hannah and Andrew always tease me. I'm never really on a break, but <laughs> my life is calmer than it could have been. Um, and then Hannah's also on a year of leave um, paid by EI, um, which is employment insurance, because she worked long enough as a teacher. Um, she's an elementary school teacher. Uh, she was able to earn enough employment insurance to take a year, uh, actually 18 months of paid parental leave. EI is not a huge amount every month. I think it's like maybe $1,000 a month or something, but you know, it pays rent and some groceries. So that combined with my income uh, and then Andrew's income from working full time uh, means that like Hannah and I can be off and focus on raising this child. Um, and then Andrew, when he's not at work, is a full time parent. I mean, he's a full time parent at work, too, but there's only so much. You can't change a diaper when you're at the office and your baby's at home. Um, but he does try to be really active and involved, even from a distance. You know, we, we send pictures during the day and video calls and, and he's really engaged. So, right. The, the point is, our day looks like this. Uh, I wake up on the nursery bed in the nursery. Uh, I wake up and get River up, um, get uh, do a morning diaper change, get them dressed, uh, and then either pass them to Hannah if they're hungry because River is uh, still nursing, or load them into the stroller and take our dog for a walk first thing and give Hannah a second to herself because uh, she's probably done two nurses through the night because um, uh, breastfed babies tend to wake up more frequently at night and need to eat more. Um, so she gets a little time to herself. I get to walk around the block. Uh, I come home, uh, get breakfast started. Hannah gets up and basically we spend the morning till from like maybe eight to 11, um, having food, hanging out with river, playing, reading books. Maybe one of us goes for another walk with them or whatever. Um, and then I, uh, river goes down for their nap. I get to go and do some writing. Um, Hannah gets, well, probably to hold a baby on her lap for <laughs> the entirety of their nap. Um, in the afternoon, again, we play games, read books, maybe go do an activity. We basically take turns with that, depending on who has something to get done that day. Um, and then Andrew gets home in the evenings, maybe 5.30 or 6, and we all have dinner together. I tend to be the house cook. Um, and Andrew, Hannah, and I all clean up the dishes together. Oh my goodness, three different people doing dishes is amazing. We also have a little countertop dishwasher that is a lifesaver. Uh, Andrew tends to do River's bedtime bath and then uh, gets them ready for bed, puts their PJs on. Um, we all read books together. Hannah does one more nurse and then I take River to put them down in the crib for, for bedtime. And with any luck, we get a little grown up time before we also go to bed. Um, and the three of us usually end up in bed between like nine and ten. Uh, I am a super night owl, so I just go and sit in the nursery on my phone in the dark for a while <laughs> until I pass out. But yeah, like that is basically our daily routine. And constantly throughout the day, we look at each other and we say, how does anybody do this with fewer parents? Because there's always a moment where River's crying or needs to be held or our dog Duncan is barking at something or, uh, you know, uh, one of our friends needs to like borrow our car or something. Who knows? Like there's always something that's coming up. And then we're like, okay, well, here's the baby. And we can just like pass them off. And there's not very many times where River just has to sit and be sad alone. We, we actually have to work very hard to make sure River gets independent play because that's a very important part of a development. But we are always there. So like we put the baby on the ground in the playpen and then just kind of watch them. And we're like, okay, play independently now. <laughs> But yeah, River gets like a ton of attention and loves like books and peekaboo and is uh, learning to pull the stand and doing all these great things. And um, something people always say to us is like, oh my gosh, I've never seen such like a happy baby. And I think it's because they are truly showered in love all the time. Um, and when we're really exhausted, we also have like a beautiful community around us. Like our neighbor across the street, Hannah taught her kids. We know her. We care. Like she's great. So she can come over and take River for a walk around the block. And we trust her to do that. So we can just call her up midday and say, hey, would you mind taking River out for a minute? We need to catch our breath. Um, or our, our old roommate who used to live in the room that's now the nursery. He lives, you know, 
maybe 10 minutes away and he can walk over whenever and he brings us dinner or he's a baker so he can make us beautiful cakes. He made a six month birthday cake for River, which we did not feed to River. We ate the cake and River had to watch. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we also have like a beautiful, beautiful community. Um, and then when we do want to do something more exceptional, like like we went apple picking this past season or say the wedding, um, we are able to, again, sort of trade off river duty so that no one person is so completely exhausted, hopefully. I do think that Hannah takes on a lot more work in general in the baby department because river is uh, chest feeding largely. Like, we have started to feed river solids, but until they're one, like their main nutrients uh, is from, from milk. So she's kind of stuck on baby duty in that regard. Um, and it's hardest for the two of them to be apart for long periods of time as a result. Um, but uh, broadly speaking, I think that we all try to balance each other out. And when, you know, if River needs to just sit on Hannah's lap for a while, let's say they're having a fussy day and sometimes all they want is to be held by Momo, then, okay, I'll take the opportunity to do the remaining dishes or to whip up our next meal or, you know, Andrew on his days off, maybe, well, He's, he's phenomenal and he will clean the house from top to bottom on his days off, despite the fact that we keep telling him he needs to relax. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, so that's definitely like a huge advantage, especially also as like uh, parents with varying disabilities. Like I deal with chronic pain. Hannah has her own health stuff going on, which is her own business, but it can be challenging. And then my partner, Andrew, also has um, enclosing spondylitis, which is an autoimmune disease that he got diagnosed with very young. Um, and it causes him, it's basically like a form of arthritis. Um, if you watch the Try Guys, uh, the little guy has enclosing spondylitis. So if you want a point of reference, that's the, that's the point of reference. Um, but yeah, so uh, he's in pain a lot of the time, and we have definitely had to make accommodations for that. Um, and I think it would be much, much harder if we had any fewer parents for us, for him to be able to, to be so hands on. Um, and, you know, Hannah has like gone out of her way to find tools to help Andrew be able to be a more hands on parent. Like she found this great um, sort of like a hip pillow that you can strap to yourself that River can sit on. So he's not, you know, putting his back out when he's just trying to sort of carry them around the house on his hip um, or, uh, you know, like these. uh <laughs> they basically look like a little baby leash, but basically this like little strap that goes around their their body so that he can hold them standing upright as they're practicing sort of waddling around and not have to be bent over and putting his back out doing that. So uh, yeah, and, and with my health concerns, I have, um, I also have an autoimmune disease and uh, it affects my, my food intake. Um, it's called encephalitic esophagitis. It's probably close to something like celiac. That's probably what people would be closest familiar with. So I have really specific dietary needs. And again, because I have two co-parents, I am able to take the time to research recipes that can fit my, uh, my, what my body's needs to go grocery shopping to specialty stores and buy food that makes myself feel good. Um, and to make a variety of me meals that make sure that they are feeding river, all the nutrients they need. Um, even though they're getting really what they need from milk, we're trying to introduce them to a variety of foods and also meet my own dietary needs. So like all of those things make a huge, huge difference. Um, a three parent household, like truly, if, if anybody out there is thinking about doing it and you have people in your life, you trust, take your, take your time building that relationship. But I would definitely recommend it if you can make it work. Cause it is just, I feel like it's the way I like, I, I feel like this is where I'm supposed to be in terms of like parenting. Like this definitely feels like, oh yeah, this meets me where I'm at as best as I could possibly imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, it comes through and everything you're sharing about how it works for you, how it's healthy for all of you. Um, and I think that is so important in a relationship, um, especially with parenting. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, I don't mean to make it out like we never have any struggles. There's definitely like hard conversations or just challenging moments. And with three different people it comes three different, very like, you know, very different personalities um, and skill sets and interests. So, you know, we've had to have big talks and we try to make time for a house meeting kind of once a month to sit down and talk, um, which I would think like even two parent families, like 
making intentional time to check in about how it's going is like so important. Um, and before River was born, uh, because we knew that, you know, we're three different people with different life goals, different preferences, whatever, um, we did sit down and make a parenting agreement. So uh, it's several pages long, and it basically, we mixed um, some stuff from other parenting agreements. Like we, we went to some classes and stuff before co-parenting um, to try to build a good foundation. So we got some resources from there. And then we also looked up the Ontario guidelines for separating parents with, and they actually have a list of questions you're, you should ask each other if you're separating. Now, obviously we weren't separating at the time and are not planning to do so right now, but we thought, well, isn't it better to have that conversation now while we all like each other than potentially have that during a time of conflict? Um, Cause uh, Hannah and I both come from divorced homes and we know that while you're going through a separation is a tough time to negotiate because um, you're probably not big fans of each other. So we sat down and did things like, okay, how do we feel about school? Do we, you know, do we have a preference for homeschooling, public schooling, religious schooling? Um, how do we feel about religion in general? How do we feel about, um, yeah, the gender neutral parenting choices? If we were to ever live apart for any reason, um, what would that look like? Do we have any requirements around that? You know, we decided that we would never live more than an hour apart from each other while River is growing up because we would never want to be in a position where it would be difficult for them to easily go between the two homes if that was a necessary thing. So um, we sat down and, and did that over the course of months, really. And once we had negotiated that, we signed our names to that document and saved it. Um, and I've shared it with a couple other friends too, um, who are interested in this kind of setup or just want to do that with their other partners or whatever. Um, that was a huge, hugely important part of our uh, relationship building process um, and co-parenting journey. And we continue to have, you know, lots of meetings where we talk through some big ideas and big concepts. And just sometimes it's a hard day. Um, something we've talked a lot about lately is, you know, where are we going to be in the next five years? Are we going to stay in the city? Do we want to move to maybe a smaller area where the Housing might be a little more affordable because Toronto is just like massively expensive. Um, or, you know, but if we leave Toronto, we lose all of our resources and community and we'd have to restart our careers. So, you know, so like having some big, big talks about who we are and where we're going. And sometimes we don't always line up, you know, like I think Hannah is has a much bigger preference for living outside the city and is much more open to living in a more um, smaller setting. Like, you know, uh, she loves like the idea of having uh, quick access to like forest or nature, um, whereas Andrew is much more of a city guy and I think would be very happy living in Toronto for a while longer. Um, although recently that's been changing, too. He started to feel kind of fed up with the city and started to open his mind up, too. And as for me, I can kind of go wherever my career and is sort of amorphous. Uh, it is uh, unclear where I'm heading. Um, I'm focusing on just getting this degree done, writing my books, making my little TikToks, and then just kind of seeing what happens. But the most likely situation is that I get a job teaching at a university, and there are tons of universities all over Ontario. So wherever we go, I could probably do that. But uh, yeah, so we've been having some big heart-to-hearts, and it's not always super easy. Three people means three opinions about everything. You should have seen us trying to figure out River's name, the naming <laughs> process. Oh my goodness. We made a Excel document and then we made Google Forms. And then we had uh, every week we would vote on our top list of names and we would get to veto one and then star another. And then we put it in a big chart. It was a whole journey to just pick a name. And then Hannah had a dream where somebody came to her in the dream and said, oh, your baby's name is River. And she told us the next day and we went, well, okay, I think that settles that. So <laughs> sometimes also the universe intervenes. Um, but yeah, it, it takes a lot of negotiation. It's, it's a lot of work, but you know, parenting is a lot of work. Um, and this is just what our version of it looks like. Yes. And I've loved that you shared all of those details, like with all of the relationships and the parenting and I think sharing so much of that, um, is, is really great. And I appreciate all of that. Now, at the end of all of my episodes, I do ask my guests a random question. So my question for you is, what movie can you recite every line to? Uh, probably Mean Girls. <laughs> I honestly haven't watched it in years, but I feel like I could recite that or uh, maybe Rent. 
those two movies were very foundational in my teenage years. <laughs> All right, that brings this episode to a close. I will, of course, be leaving Marcus's website and TikTok in the description if you'd like to go and see what they are up to. And if you would like to connect with the podcast, our website is also in the description. It brings you to all of our social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. It brings you to all of our past episodes. And there's also a link in the description if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily through a one-time donation or recurring donation. And if you'd like to be a guest to share your own story, my email is in the description as well. And I would love to hear from you. So thank you so much, Marcus, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Bye.